I'm really excited to be back here. As Will said, it's my third time here. Um, and a lot has happened to me since the first time I got up on the stage and talked to you all about lean product management. I changed jobs a couple times between that. I moved to Italy. I tried to start a company. It failed miserably. I came back to New York and I started consulting. And I started working with companies on product management, on implementing lean, lean startup, agile, Kanban, a whole slew of different processes. The great thing is that by working with so many different companies, just big and small, I've learned so much. And these companies, now, they've been startups that make no money. There have been large companies that make billions of dollars. There's been some medium companies in there that make about $100 million in revenue a year. But with every single company, I see the same exact trend happening to them. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. So when I originally start working with companies, I'll go in and I'll ask them, you know, what's your processes? Tell me about your KPIs. What are your goals? And they start saying things to me like this. Well, we want to ship four features in the next quarter, and that's our goal for the year. Okay. Um, but we have all of these requests from our stakeholders. We don't really know how to prioritize them. Then our customers are complaining, so we're putting those onto the roadmap. But we just don't have enough people to build with it. And also, also we're, we're now at this phase where we're kind of getting to be a bigger company, and we have to be grown-ups. So we have to make our product roadmaps a year in advance. So these companies start telling me things, and when I hear them, I cringe. I go, oh, no, because it's really evident to me that they're stuck in something that I'm calling the build trap. Now, the build trap is a really dangerous place for a company to be in. It's dangerous because being in it prevents you from innovating, from, being, uh, from releasing great products. And most companies that I talk to are stuck into this place. So how does the build trap actually work? Let's look at it. When we're starting off as a company, usually we're pretty good. We'll have an idea, maybe we'll do some testing and iterating, we might build a little bit of an MVP. We'll try to find something right for customers. And we eventually work our way up into product market fit. But once we hit product market fit, something terrible happens. We get stuck building and we stop validating. So we end up adding feature after feature into our products, releasing it out to customers, and we never stop to analyze if this is what we should be building. So then, when a new customer comes into our platform, they see all our features, and they look like this. What is all this? I don't know where to start. What are these features? What am I supposed to be doing in here? They get really confused. And our existing customers get really, really confused because the things they used to use are now piled under a whole slew of new features. So now our products become this hodgepodge of complexity with tons of features that our customers don't actually use. And even worse, half of those features are usually broken. Remember this thing? I bet you a lot of people have seen this thing in their office within 24 hours. Someone thought it would be a great idea to be like, hey, let's take a printer and a copier and a scanner and a faxer and a stapler and a magician and a cat and stick them all together and put it in an office. But the problem with this thing is that it doesn't work. None of those features actually work. And that's why this is still funny today, even though this was built in 1999. So, almost 20 years later, we're still yelling at the printer to print one thing, right? But it's not only printers that run into this mistake. It's actually our software companies, too. So take Foursquare, for instance. Foursquare started off as a great app that lets you check into places, and you can discover new places to go. So it had really simple features. You get in, you check in, you can kind of see if you get more points than your friends, and sometimes you get a free margarita. That's why I used it. So I got a lot of free margaritas with Foursquare at the beginning. And then they just started adding more and more features. It became so complex and so heavy with features that nobody could figure out where to check in. That button just disappeared somehow. So now Foursquare is split up into Swarm and Foursquare. And nobody uses it anymore because it's just too complicated. It doesn't serve their purpose. On the B2B side, we have things like Salesforce. Now Salesforce is a very successful company, don't get me wrong. But the thing about Salesforce is it has so many features and it's so complex that you have to hire another company to come in and install the features that you need in it, your company. So wait, what? So I have to hire another company that's not Salesforce to come in and tell me what features that my company should be using. That's complex. <laughs> that's a feature overload problem right there. And that's not something most B2B companies can sustain. Foursquare is lucky because almost everybody uses it. But that's not true for most companies. 
So we get into this habit where we keep adding feature after feature, but we actually never stop and say, hey, maybe we should take something away. When was the last time your company actually killed a product? When was the last time you were like, nope, it's not working, let me take it away? Usually never happens. And then once in a blue moon when that does happen, we usually come up with four more products to replace it. We stick those on the product backlog, and then our product backlogs start looking like a five-year-old's Christmas list. So we get stuck in this trap of just building and building and releasing features and adding more complexity onto our products. But how do we actually get stuck in that cycle? There's a lot of factors that contribute into this build trap. And it all starts with this. Creating new products is full of uncertainty, but we always fail to recognize that. We as humans really don't like uncertainty. We're like, ooh, uncomfortable, don't like it. So what we do is we try to fill that gap as fast as possible. And we usually come up with solutions very quickly, and they sound comfortable, and we like them. They're like a warm, fuzzy blanket that we put on. And we get comfortable, and we say, yep, it's a good solution. Let's stick with that. But the problem with this, with jumping to conclusions and solutions that fast, is that more often than not, well, almost always, actually, our product ideas are incredibly biased, and especially those first solution ideas. And you can see these really evidently when you go out and you ask people, why are you building that? So let's look at some of the biases. With one company that I was working with, um, this company wanted to build a mobile app. So they brought me in and they said, we have an idea for a mobile app. We need you to come and teach us how to do like, product manage it, management to launch it. So I came in and I asked them, OK, so why are you building a mobile app? Like, What do you want to do with this? And they said, well, we built a mobile app in December and a lot of people signed up. So we figured if we just build another one for something else, a lot of people will sign up. OK. So this is something that I call the copycat experience. And this happens to a lot of companies. We often confuse correlation and causation. And we say, just because this worked for one problem, this solution worked for one problem, is going to work for another problem over here. And we automatically just try to take that solution and slap it on a different problem. But we're usually not in the same scenario. So there's no guarantee that that solution that worked for somebody else or for a different problem will work for you. And yet we do this all the time. Another bias that I like so much is called the Steve Jobs complex. You may have experienced this if you were talking to a startup or a product manager. Usually they come in and say, well, I can't talk to customers because my idea is so groundbreaking that they won't understand it until they see it. What? So when we get into this, we get into this problem of thinking that we're the experts and we're really awesome and we can come up with all the ideas to solve these problems. And a lot of people, when I tell them, okay, you're gonna have to go out and talk to customers about their problems anyway, they go, well, you know, Steve Jobs didn't do that. Apple doesn't do that. They just launched the iPad. No. Apple doesn't just sit there, wake up one day and go, hey, maybe we should build an iPad. Okay, let's put that into the assembly line. No, there's a lot of research, a lot of market research that goes into that, a lot of designing, a lot of testing to figure out if this is the right product at the right time. So we're not all experts out there that can just pull something out of thin air and be like, oh, this novel idea is going to work. We can't do that. That is a bias. The last one I'm going to talk about today that's pretty common is called anchoring. Now, at one company, um, anchoring is when you fixate on a certain piece of insignificant data, and you hold on to that, and you use it to justify everything that you do. So at one company that I was at, a B2B company, we used this one. 80% of our users log on every day. So you go up to the CEO, and you'd be like, hey, why are we building this feature? And you'd be like, because 80% of our users log on every day. Hey, why are we building dashboards? Because 80% of our users log on every day. Why are we building a forecaster? Because 80% of our users log on every day. It became over and over and over, and we fixated on it. Because it was a good number. It was a good number that 80% of users log on every day. But the thing is, it doesn't explain everything. It doesn't justify why we're building these products. And a lot of times, these metrics have absolutely nothing to do with what we're building. So when we latch onto these numbers, we're not actually justifying why we should be building it correctly. So to get rid of these biases, we need to take a step back and actually consider what the customer's problems are. But when we start doing these at companies, um, something interesting really happens. I run a workshop where I come into companies and I get everybody who talks to their users to sit down and write out in post-it notes what they hear the problems are from users. So I want quotes. I want things that come out of users' mouths. I want actual problems. And when we put them all together, they say that the problem is usually this, something like this. Customers don't have custom dashboards. And I go, OK. So what's the solution? Custom dashboards. <laughs> no, 
no, right? <laughs> no, that's, that's not a problem. But how many times have you seen this when you've asked somebody, what's the problem we're solving? And they say, the problem is that my customers don't have the thing that I'm building. That is not a customer problem. Customer problems are not the lack of your product's features. They're just not that. Customers have specific problems of things that they can't do or can't achieve. They're not that they're missing the thing that you're building. But a lot of the times, we can't even figure out what customers' problems are because we're not even taking the time to go out and talk to our customers. We usually get most of our feedback from talking to, um, from talking to customers through complaints and feature requests. So if you're in a consumer app um, product, they might be sending in an email saying, I can't do this thing. And you go, OK, I got customer feedback. Let's slap it on the backlog. Or you might be a B2B company, and you're trying to sell things to them. So you ask them, what would you like to see? And customers would be like, um, I guess I could use like, um, you know, like a preferences tool. OK, cool. Customers really want a preferences tool. We should build that. So we get really excited about that. But we're not going out and doing proper research to figure out what the problems are. And we get all these complaints and these feature requests, and we put them on the backlog. So we look at our backlog, and we go, OK, let's slap it on there. We're going to put it in Q4. All right, when we get around to Q4, we're going to do that. Q4 rolls around. We've got this, um, we've got this product uh, roadmap, but we leave no time for actually figuring out if we should be building the right things here. We just say, OK, pull it off the backlog, start specking it, start building it. Let's put it out, and let's get it out to customers. Then we get it out to customers. And we have no way to measure success. All the time, we ship features out there, and we're not measuring if they're doing anything. We don't put metrics around our features. We don't go back and check on them. We don't say, hey, remember that thing we spent seven months building last year? Is it working? Are people actually using it? Are they doing things with it that we think they're doing with it. We don't check up on these things. We just leave it out there. And that's how our products become so big and so complex. We never go back and measure if these things are successful or not. And a lot of this has to do with our mentality as companies, right? We get into these mentalities and mantras of like move fast and break things, stay focused and keep shipping, and done is better than perfect. And all these battle cries we have like on our development teams they all come down to this mindset of building and shipping is the most valuable thing we can do as a company. And we all get really stuck on that. So we start viewing output and outcome, uh, output over outcome. And when we get into that mindset, all that matters is that developers are writing code and designers are designing and we're shipping four features next quarter. Doesn't matter if people use it, we're just shipping four features next quarter. Checkbox, we did our work, right? Also, at the same time, we have no collaboration between our teams. We've got designers sitting over there. They're wearing the hipster glasses. They're looking pretty cool on their Macs. We've got developers over there. They can't really talk to people. They're a little antisocial. I don't want to talk to them. We've got salespeople over there. There's a lot of frat bros. Nobody's interacting with each other, right? Nobody gets together and says, hey, maybe we should talk these things through. And we don't promote collaboration on our teams either. We don't give people the opportunity to do these things. I have done so many workshops in the past year and I think I'm teaching them great stuff, but the number one thing they say out of these workshops that's most valuable is, oh my god, we actually collaborated. Everybody, every single workshop, doesn't matter what I do, the whole team goes, wow, I actually collaborated with somebody today. It's amazing. But we never provide those opportunities for people. So if you are in a lucky company, which maybe some of you are, maybe you've recognized some of these problems and you tried to fix it. So you might have tried Lean Startup, you might have tried Scrum, you might have tried Agile or something. Maybe you started building MVPs. You spent a couple weeks out there testing things, talking to customers, putting things out. And at one point, you panic. And you go, ah, oh, what have I done? I just spent three weeks talking to customers, but I haven't actually built anything. Oh, no, no, no. We've got investors who need stuff. We have a whole department head to relate to. We haven't released any features. The developers aren't coding. Oh, my god. What do developers do if they're not coding? Oh, my god. So you freak out. So everybody freaks out, and they go, well, you know what? Let's go build something for the next couple sprints, and we'll go back to this lean stuff later. Yeah, we'll go revisit that in a couple weeks when we have time. We have to build something now. So the thing is, you never come back to it. And then you tell me we tried lean and it didn't work. And the thing is, you just go back to building feature after feature after feature, and you get stuck in this build, tra uh, this build trap that's an endless loop. So how do we actually solve these problems? How do we get out of this build trap and into a way where we can build things that people want? 
And the first thing to realize as a company, building is the easy part. Figuring out what to build is the hard part. And we never recognize this, right? As developers, we know how to code. We know how to actually write the code. We know how to develop it. There are things you need to figure out, but you're good at your job, and you know a process for going about how to figure that out. As designers, we know how to make great designs if we're given a task. Those building things are pretty easy. They're pretty straightforward. But figuring out what to build, that's the complex part of this. That's the thing we really need to spend our time on. And we need to take a step back and realize that. So we're going to get into trouble if we don't figure that out. And we need to come up with ways to actually figure out what are we going to build. The first step of doing that is to terminate your bad ideas. So, our first ideas are not our best ideas. We learn that they're very biased. And we need to get rid of our biases and test our assumptions. So the best way to do that is try to filter out the bad ideas from the good ideas so that we can focus ourselves on the good ideas and all our energy there. So we take a step back. We figure out what is the problem that the customer is actually experiencing. And we generate tons of solutions for it. We don't just sit there and stick to our first solution. We get people together. We get a team together and we say, what are all the possible ways that we could possibly solve this. Then, when we have a list of solutions, we get out there and we test them quickly. So you start testing things in small little experiments. You get feedback from your users, and you kill the ones that aren't working as fast as possible. So what does this look like? With one of the companies that I was working with, um, which was the mobile app one I was talking about, we decided to test if the first idea was the best idea. So first, we went out to talk to our customers. Now, the idea was kind of Tinder for professional networking. We were going to make an app where people could kind of professionally meet, grab coffee with each other, and see if they could find mentors through it. This was their idea. So we said, OK, how can we test this first? Let's get out and talk to our demographics, to the people who would be using this, and see what problems they have around networking. And when we went out there and we asked them their problems and we pitched them our solution, they said, oh, no, 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 no. Wait, wait. I don't feel comfortable meeting people that way. Mm -mm. Nope, I am not going to meet a stranger on a Tinder-like professional networking app for a professional setting. I'm not going to get coffee with my potential boss on this kind of uh, you know, almost dating app. Why would I want to do that? So they said, I really don't feel comfortable meeting people this way. The only way I make professional connections is when we have something shared in common. I like to go to meetups and meet people through that. I like to have friends introduce me to people. I wouldn't do this. OK. So we knew that was a bad idea, and we were able to scrap it pretty quickly after talking to quite a few people. But what we also did was follow up with these people and find out what problems were really uh, stumping them. What were they having trouble with professionally? And they all said something very similar. They said, there's a lot of advice for me out there on how to get started with things, but not how to continue. For example, I want to ask for a raise, and I know how to approach it, but I don't know what to continue with or how to, um, how to build up to it. They just give me one piece of advice. I wish somebody would make me a step-by-step -step guide that just told me how to do these things. And we said, oh, this is really interesting because this is a clear problem. Everybody is really saying they have this problem, and we are capable of solving it as a company. We have this information that they want. We can productize it. So we decided to run tests around one of the problems, which was resumes. And we ran one test, which we pitched a bunch of people, a resume concierge, somebody to hold your hand and see if uh, they would pay for it. So they take you step by step through how to build a resume. This one failed. People didn't want to pay for it. It just didn't work. But at the same time, we tested something else. We tested something called guides, where we put step by step information around these resumes into a packaged guide they could buy and, uh, and do these steps on their own. And 5,500 people signed up for this. 5,500 people from a landing page when we just advertised it for one week. And that was huge. That was all the people that signed up for that previous mobile app that they wanted to build. So we got really great response with this. And we knew that this is where we should concentrate our efforts and try to productize this. So after that, we started running a little bit more tests, figuring out what we should put into these guides until we got a product that we knew people loved. Now, this is great. But you might be sitting there going, OK, well, we have set processes. We have set roadmaps. How can I actually put these things in? And it's tricky. And it's been a struggle to really find that with a lot of my companies. So with people that I work with, I introduce them to something called the problem roadmap. Now, the problem roadmap works in tandem with your product roadmap. But this gives you space to test and iterate. So the way that it works is that we section things off into time buckets. 
So for example, quarters, right? And on quarter one, we say, this is our goal, this is our vision and our KPI we're gonna work towards. And we start off by figuring out what are the most pressing customer problems we have, and we leave ourselves time to discover and experiment around them, test, iterate, gather that knowledge, try to figure out what they really need, do a bunch of MVPs, do some experiments, and we build and we validate that. And at the end of this, when we find something that people actually want, then we put it into the planning mode that we're used to, spec it, build it, and slot it onto, we'll spec it and put it onto a roadmap. So what this looked like for this company that I was just talking about was something like this. So at the top here, we have the guides project, and this is where in test one and test two and test three, we're putting out those landing pages, getting information, refining our solutions, and trying to figure it out. By August, we were able to build a version one and get it out to customers and get more feedback to a little beta group. But at the same time, the problem roadmap works in tandem with your set product roadmap because there are some things that you've already validated, right? You already know you just have to do some things. There's bugs you have to fix. There's products you have to build because you already went out there and validated them, hopefully. So at the same time, you have to slot in time for those. So this gives you a little bit more room to experiment and test and have something that's a little bit more concrete around it while also building the other things. So once you find the thing that you want to build, after you do these problem roadmaps and you test and you iterate, we usually stick it on a roadmap. We can't build things right away, so we usually slot it in for development a little bit in the future. But the problem is that we rarely go back and actually analyze the product to see if the solution is correct. So the next step to really getting out of the build trap is taking the time to go through our solutions and our roadmaps and what we have planned in the future and figure out if we're building the right things. We gotta get everybody together and go through a set of questions to figure this out. So these are the questions, some of the questions that I like to ask. What is the problem and who's the customer? Right off the bat. Now, if you have not tested and validated, those are actually really hard problems for you to answer. I ran a workshop answering this and maybe three out of the 25 products that we had on the roadmap were able to answer these questions. What is the problem and who's the customer? So if you have not done any testing and validating, that's a great place to start. If you have, that should be pretty easy. But we also have to ask things like, what KPI will this change? How are we going to, um, how are we gonna tell that this is working? How much should it, change it, uh, should it change it by? And why is this the right time? Rarely do we ask ourselves, why are we building this right now? A lot of the times we start building things because we say, oh, it's been on the roadmap long enough, we just gotta get to it and build it, right? We keep pushing it off, we keep pushing it off, and we just say, oh, it's been pushed off long enough, we gotta build it. So we have to ask ourselves, why now? Why is this the right time to build it? Why not in a year? Why not in two years? Why not next month? Why now? So then we go into business priority. What do we need this to be successful? What features of the solution need to be successful in here? And we analyze all of this at the team, as a team. And at the end of the day, we make a decision. And we say, okay, this product we know enough information about and we're definitely gonna build. And that goes into build and prioritize. Or, you know what? We weren't able to answer some of these questions. We're still not sure if this is the right thing to build. So we need more information. And this bucket allows us to go out, to test, to iterate, to kind of get the more information that we need and then make a decision about it. It might go into build and prioritize and get slapped on the roadmap. Or you might say no. You might find out, nope, we definitely should not be building that now. And at the end of the day, that's really powerful for a product manager or for anybody to say. Just say, nope, this is not what we should be building. We don't say it often enough. So once we actually weed out those things we should not be building in our roadmaps, and we start approaching the things we should be building, all those things need to have a measure of success around it. We need to make sure that when we are working on things, we have ways to check in and see if we're being successful or not. And these things really need to focus on quality over quantity. So for every feature that we release, we say, if we launch this product, I expect this KPI to increase or decrease by X percent in this amount of time. This starts holding us accountable when we put this on every product, right? Because we know that in six months, we need to go check in on it and make sure that we're hitting it. And it gives us options. Because if we're not hitting our KPIs, if we're not hitting our goals, we can make decisions on should we kill this feature and reduce the complexity of our systems? Or should we go and refine it? Or should we take different actions for it? So this is really, really powerful. But at the same time, we can't just measure the success of our products. We need to measure the success of our teams as well. And we need to have the right metrics for that. 
We have to start rewarding people for learning and not just building. We need to at least not punish people for not doing, right? For taking their hands off the keyboard. So managers, you need to come up with a way to let your people know that it's okay if you take your hands off the keyboard for a minute and go talk to your customers. It's okay if you go and you collaborate with people so you learn and you solve problems, but we don't have systems to reward that. And we really need to go back and focus on this learning and it's so important because learning reduces that uncertainty. By learning as a team, we get to say, yes, I've learned enough and I'm sure that when we release this product, it's the best thing that we can do at this moment. We know that our customers really want this and that they're gonna like it. And we know that this is the right thing to build. So this all boils down to, and especially this mindset, that lean startup is a process, lean is a mindset. So what do I mean by this? Lean startup is a process for testing, iterating, having hypotheses. Lean is a mindset for organizations that focuses on customer value and learning to increase that customer value. And the problem is that when we all go out there and we say we tried lean, we're actually going through all those motions of lean startup, but we have absolutely no culture or mindset to support it. And every time we do that, we fail. So if you don't have a system or a, or a culture in the background to back up all these processes, you're gonna get stuck in the build trap and you're never gonna be able to find products that your customers really love. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.